Hello, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. What is your name and what is your role? Marisa Drew is my name, and I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer and head of a group called Sustainability Strategy Advisory and Finance at Credit Suisse. And how long have you been at Credit Suisse? Going on 20 years now. <laughs> and how long have you been in your specific role? So I took this on in the fall of 2017, mm -hmm. so and quite a journey. <laughs> mm -hmm. I must say I didn't have any idea what I was getting into when I took mm -hmm. this role on, and uh, here we are uh, several years later, and it's just been an extraordinary journey, I have to say. Now, can you talk about that time when you went back in 2017 when you decided to take on this role? You said you weren't sure what was, what was to be expected of you, so sure. can you talk about that journey? Well, it started with um, the vision of my then chief executive. Mm -hmm. So I happened to be in a meeting in London, and I exited that meeting to a phone call from my CEO out of the blue. And mm -hmm. um, in a 40,000-person organization, that doesn't normally happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it was one of those moments where the first thing you think is, what did I do wrong? <laughs> and I returned his phone call, and he said, I bet you thought you might have done something wrong because you don't get a call out of the blue from your CEO. So he had a bit of a chuckle about that. And then he said, uh, could you come see me in Zurich? There's something on my mind I'd like to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. So this is where it all started. And um, it wasn't even a fully formed idea in his mind, mm -hmm. but what he was seeing as he was interacting with all of our different client segments, an increasing um, desire on their part uh, to, and they were grappling with how do I either as an investor mm -hmm. uh, find values alignment with my deployment of capital mm -hmm. or our corporate clients grappling with whatever the factors were that were um, sort of percolating either within their business mm -hmm. or their investor base or whatever the stakeholder um, was that was in question asking them to align their businesses around sustainability. Mm -hmm. And there was, and he felt that there was a place for us as a financial services provider and mm -hmm. as a global institution to provide advice and counsel and, and capital raising for mm -hmm. that journey. And so while it wasn't a fully formed idea, you know, he had suggested that this was something that was going to be truly strategic for the bank going forward. Mm -hmm. And this is where I credit him for the vision. Mm -hmm. Because at the time I was running investment banking and it, and it hadn't really crossed my frame of reference in a material way. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit out of the blue for me and it wasn't a linear, obvious next step mm -hmm. in my career. And he said, um, I don't really know what this thing is, but you should run it. <laughs> and okay. I was like, okay. And so it did come out of the blue. And as I started to think about it and really wasn't entirely sure what it was, my first reaction was I thought this was either something that was resident in our risk function mm -hmm. or alternatively in CSR. So mm -hmm. i.e. something that was kind of being a marketing document of our place in society. Mm -hmm. So I approached it a little bit with cynicism mm -hmm. and I said, you know, I am a business builder and I'm a frontline person and I've always been responsible for a P&L in my career. And if really this is either risk or CSR, those are kind of corporate functions and maybe it's not for me. Mm -hmm. And um, he asked me a seminal question and he said, uh, I want you to think in a slightly different frame of reference. Think mm -hmm. about this as a strategic imperative for our organization. And also, let me ask you a question. What would you like your legacy to be mm. after nearly 30 some odd years in banking? Mm -hmm. And it was a pretty important question because as an investment banker, we don't often sit around thinking about what we want our legacy to be. Mm -hmm. We're really running for the next deal, the next transaction, the next, mm -hmm. you know, large uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that reflection time allowed me to do some deep thinking personally, but also do a lot of research as to what, what was going on in this ecosystem. And uh, I... The more I got involved and mm -hmm. the deeper I got, the more I realized this is a really, really seminal moment mm -hmm. in, in terms of how finance was going to be reshaped. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I said, I'm in. And that's okay. how it all started. <laughs> okay. So, so in 2017, what was your understanding of sustainability? I mean, you said that it wasn't something yeah. that had, you know, come to the forefront mm -hmm. of, you know, investment choices. But what was your understanding then? Well, it really had, I think, started in some ways in the risk function mm -hmm. in many ways mm -hmm. um, as and probably the earlier in financial services, the early organizations that were seeing this mm -hmm. were insurance companies mm -hmm. because they were seeing the effects of climate change, for instance, on their mm -hmm. physical assets or their insured risks. And so it's those sorts of things that um, you started to really permeate mm -hmm. the thinking around risk and risk modeling and risk mitigation and lending and so mm -hmm. on. On the other hand, there has also been a very long and well-trodden path of CSR documents. Right. And so those were the two places where it started. And that was my uh, initial appreciation and understanding. Mm -hmm. But the, as I say, the more I got into this, the more I realized that this is actually was something that was going to ripple through everything that we right. do. It was going to be a frontline, very serious frontline opportunity mm -hmm. as much as it was a risk um, 
issue. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was because it is so pervasive and in many respects so existential. Mm -hmm. My feeling was that this really was going to be a complete shift in the financial services system. Mm -hmm. You know, the need to mobilize capital at mm -hmm. scale, the more you dig into the UN Sustainable Development Goals mm -hmm. and you realize where the gaps are, mm -hmm. um, that also was informative for me because as I s really understood the world's biggest challenges as identified by the UN SDGs, mm -hmm. what you realize when you do the math, if we're gonna get there by 2030, is there isn't enough government money or philanthropic capital in the world to solve those SDGs. Private capital was a necessity to step in and mm -hmm. therefore that is my world. Mm -hmm. So in hindsight, it was a good decision to and The to most take amazing the lead. decision. So, you know, I do credit my CEO at the time of uh, having the vision and giving mm -hmm. me the opportunity. Mm -hmm. and, and I think he did see something probably in my background that in mm -hmm. his mind was going to be appropriate for this role. Mm -hmm. And um, it, he definitely saw it before I did. <laughs> and how has your role evolved since then? So when I started, it was very much a clean sheet of paper, mm -hmm. and I would I, I often say it was a startup with underneath the umbrella of a mm -hmm. large organization because mm -hmm. I went from running a very very big business with you know nearly a thousand people to mm -hmm. this tiny little startup, and and we had a very very clean slate to define it as we saw fit. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the way I started was asking questions of my clients. It's always about client service, and it depends on the segment of client in terms of what it was that they were looking for from us. On the one hand, we have private clients who are investing their own personal capital, mm -hmm. and that was really about values alignment and could you find investment opportunities that spoke to those passions, and in many cases, those were thematic. So what does the family stand for? What does the family care about? Is it education or healthcare or life below water? And they, are, they were seeking an opportunity to take the passion about those topics and translate that into something that was investable. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have corporate clients who are on a sustainability journey to migrate their businesses, and they're looking for classic investment banking services in many cases. Mm -hmm. It is M&A um, advice, mm -hmm. buying and selling of assets. It could be um, raising capital to fund the investment in the transition journey. Mm -hmm. And it was also about backing the startups who are the disruptors. Mm -hmm. So all of those things were permeating the business. So when I listened to the clients and heard what they were saying, um, it, it very much then the path became clear about how organizationally to set ourselves up to try to service those needs mm -hmm. almost by segment. And then there was another area that observationally um, was very important to me. Um, in my career, I have been a part of a lot of capital market cycles mm -hmm. or the building of new asset classes. And typically, I could see many analogs here. Um, you need a common taxonomy. You need a common mm -hmm. language, a common set of de definitions, mm -hmm. and a common set of standards. Mm -hmm. At my heart, I, I believe sort of my role is about the mobilization of capital. Mm -hmm. It's at scale and mm -hmm. directed towards solving some of these world big challenges, whether they be environmental or social. Mm -hmm. And in order for capital to scale, the markets have to have confidence. And yeah. confidence is bred on market adopted standards, mm -hmm. rigor, mm -hmm. you know, um, a good data, mm -hmm. good disclosure regimes, and so on. And mm -hmm. so I felt that uh, there was a role for us to play there too. Mm -hmm. And so building an effort to try to collaborate with others to build those standards and the taxonomy and all the things that you know mm -hmm. you see happening now, I needed. I felt was a necessary part of the enabling conditions to make this all happen. Mm -hmm. So we've come to a point now where a chief sustainability officer is more commonplace than it was when you originally had taken this role. Yes, um, and I think the the question is is you know why have we gotten to a part of a point where this is actually really important mm -hmm. and why. And, you know, why is there more emphasis being placed on this role specifically as opposed to a risk role or mm -hmm, a, a mm -hmm. standard CSR role? I think what you're seeing is the absolute translation of this moving from risk to opportunity. Mm -hmm. So this is strategic for organizations. Mm -hmm. And it's not just financial services. It's literally every company. Mm -hmm. Because if we are to meet these goals, um, right. the objectives... Uh, we really strategically have to change. We have to mm -hmm. think about our organizations in completely different ways. Mm -hmm. It is who we service, mm -hmm. who are our clients, mm -hmm. and many of our clients, or all of our clients in some ways are on this journey. Right. So we've got to be able to be facile enough with their needs to be able to service them in a robust way. Mm -hmm. It is the capital provision if you're in my world in mm -hmm. financial services, um, and that is bread and butter to what we do, sure. but you need the sustainability lens on it. Mm -hmm. You also need to engage with your stakeholders, and when I mean stakeholders, I mean external stakeholders like regulators or investors. Mm -hmm. They care about these topics, and so you need to address that as well. They're asking questions if they're investing in a company. You know, what is your sustainability footprint, mm -hmm. and what is um, your risk profile around sustainability, mm -hmm. i.e., are you, are you cognizant of what those risks might be, and mm -hmm. how are you addressing them? 
There's also market best practice that they're saying, if I'm going to invest in your company, here are some very baseline minimum standards I'm expecting, and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. And then the other group of stakeholders, of course, are employees, mm -hmm. very much driven by our next generation of employees who deeply, deeply care. Mm -hmm. And it's I, I call them an activist and, and committed generation. Mm -hmm. um, they are very um, emotionally tied right. to the topic. Mm -hmm. And rightfully so, in mm -hmm. particular on the environment. They do not like the world that they're inheriting. I think mm -hmm. in many cases they're feeling very uh, nervous and stressed about the state of the world. Mm -hmm. And they, therefore, it's a call to action for them. Mm -hmm. And they want to work for companies they believe are genuinely on the journey to try to make things better. And mm -hmm. it's very, very serious for them in terms of who do they want to work for and and what creates loyalty and, and also is their values alignment between that mission of theirs and what they do every day. So when you take that whole broader stakeholder context, it, it then I think leads you to the why this is becoming a very serious and strategic role and a senior role. Mm -hmm. Right, because the tone has to come from the top, and it has to permeate throughout your organization. And that's complex when you're thinking about the multi-stakeholder lens on all of this. So. Um, so how is a chief sustainability officer role different than traditional roles? And what skill set do you need uh, to be successful in your role? Well, because the chief sustainability officer role as we know it today hasn't really existed, in some respects you are carving the role in your own likeness. There isn't a well-trodden path as if as other other roles are in at, at executive levels in, in companies and in financial services, whether that be a CFO or whether that be head of HR or marketing mm -hmm. or strategy. So in a funny way, the CSO role has a bit of strategy to it. It has a bit of operations to it and a, a little bit of uh, something that is not typical, which is role of chief influencer. Mm -hmm. I think in this place that is so dynamic and so fast, there's a massive education learning curve. And oftentimes the role of a CSO is to try to force change in an organization, sometimes ahead of where the organization is ready to be. And therefore you really do need to use a lot of influence and pull power to bring people along uh, that journey with you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you also face cynics because this is a space that isn't, doesn't have necessarily always universal adoption in every facet of what it is. I think more broadly people understand sustainability, sustainability is important, mm -hmm. but they don't know how to translate that in a functional way with the role that they have in the organization. If it's mm -hmm. a client coverage role and the client isn't engaging, you know, do they care? Should they mm -hmm. care if the client doesn't care? Mm -hmm. It's these sorts of uh, important questions that some of our uh, colleagues ask as they're trying to grapple with how do they think about embedding sustainability in their business lines. Is it gonna be profitable or not? You know, it, it, there's a lot there. So the role of CSO I think does have this massive piece of it which is capturing hearts and minds of your organization in a directed and strategic way. Mm -hmm. And I think that requires somewhat different skills than some of your classic roles in an organization. I think you have to have a thick skin. Mm -hmm. I think you have to be very persistent. I do think you have to have the ability to create credibility or start with credibility, because I do think it would be very hard to influence people if they didn't think you're a serious business person or that you had the mandate or that you understood what their challenges are. I often say, you know, the best area of success is if you can put yourself in the shoes of your stakeholder mm -hmm. and understand why they're resisting you. It's not because they're resisting for resisting sake, it's either sake, it's either because they're not sure it's appropriate or um, necessary for their client or their clients pushing back. It's those kinds of things. So I think that you need to help them along the journey. And that requires a little bit of soft skill expertise. <laughs> and then I think you also have to have the ability to be quite flexible because if, the, if this industry and this sector is so dynamic, what we're doing today and what's important today is definitely not, I think even in six months, gonna be the area of focus. It's moving that fast. Mm -hmm. And so you've gotta be adaptable and flexible to understand you know, how to move along with the maturation of the industry. I also think, I, I, I sit back and I say also, what are the themes that are emerging because of disruption or because we've learned something from climate science that's really, really important and crucial in this equation? Mm -hmm. Or what social uh, trends are happening that our investors are saying, this is important to us. Can you find an investment opportunity around a social topic 
or as a company and with its place in society, how do we respond to a movement like Black Lives Matter and, and participate in trying to bridge inequities? So, you know, this is not a static place. So I think that resiliency and that ability to deal with massive change is a piece of uh, the, the equation as well. Yeah. You mentioned stakeholders, and I think one of the things is that no company can achieve this alone. So yes. there is a huge importance placed on things like ecosystem, you know, mm -hmm. for example, partnerships, yes. like your partnership with the UN Global Compact. Yep. So how does that fit into, you know, achieving your objectives and mm -hmm. actually, you know, fostering this desire to, you know, work towards more sustainability? Sure. Um, it, it's it really the partnership angle on this, and, I, and it's classic SDG 17, yes. right? It's there for a reason. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it, I think it is because this is bigger than any one of us, mm -hmm. right? If it's a climate change issue, if it's a social issue, if it's the whole UN Sustainable Development Goals objective, um, it is bigger than any one organization, any one government, um, any civil society organization. So therefore, if we're going to have a fighting chance of, of getting to the ultimate objective, we've mm -hmm. got to collaborate with each other. And it's interesting for me because when you operate, as an example, just in financial services, it's a very highly competitive field, right? Always has been. And so there was this little bit this notion that, you know, I can't, you know, open my kimono and share with you because, you know, you are my deepest, you know, strongest competitor. And I think there is a very different approach now, which is if we uh, do link arms and we have a shared and common mission, that uh, together we can make change. So perfect example might be... Um, the work that we're doing with the Sustainable Markets Initiative, the SMI under the auspices of um, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. Mm -hmm. He brought together the leaders in financial services and, and all in a room and saying this is a non-branded, non-competitive thing. Um, let's work together to try to um, follow a whole host of initiatives where we can drive the mobilization of capital. And that can be in standard settings. We've got an initiative in that space. We've got voluntary carbon markets where we really, really need to get it to a universal mm -hmm. view on a price for carbon and how carbon will trade and behave in the, in the financial system. Uh, how do we label green infrastructure so that we can, again, uh, create the enabling condition to really drive capital in infrastructure investment, which is so needed, on, uh, but it has to be green and there has to be that standard and mm -hmm. so on. So this is a great example where historically the idea that you would get the top group of banks together focusing on things that were opportunistic rather than regulatory driven mm -hmm. um, was almost unheard of. Mm -hmm. And then if you take it to another level, which is um, the collaboration across sectors mm -hmm. with um, unnatural actors, as I call them, working together on the same project or maybe even in the same financing, we now, every time we're creating a sustainable investment opportunity, I'm actually seeking out the opportunity to collaborate. It could be with an NGO. We've done a number of funds recently where our partner is an NGO. Mm -hmm. So in the past, the NGOs might be the ones sort of holding banks to account and not necessarily looking very favorably on us. Mm -hmm. And now they are our best partners. And this recognition that they've got great expertise to bear, um, particularly when we're talking about um, conservation opportunities. You know, they've been on the ground for with deep expertise for years and years and years, and we aren't conservation experts. We might be able to create the structure or to distribute that and raise the capital for it. Mm -hmm. So if we can bring them into the project, mm -hmm. what a beautiful combination. So uh, all of this is, is happening, and it's very, very different than the behavior of the past. Mm -hmm. So the financial services industry has a, a, a huge role to play in this because of the, the investments channeling the investments. Sure. What else do you think that the industry can be doing to accelerate change? I think the biggest one is a, an adoption of a common set of standards mm -hmm. um, because as soon as we do that and we all agree on what good looks like, mm -hmm. then investors have confidence and capital mm -hmm. flows. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one area. The other area is that we can use our power and our influence to... Um, try to work with policymakers on the things that really matter. Mm -hmm. So whether it is to seek policy to create a go zone, mm -hmm. um, which will create an opportunity, or in some cases, a no-go zone. Mm -hmm. So if we're able to put a price on, on carbon emitting activities, all of a sudden what will happen? Capital is very efficient and it flows to the places where mm -hmm. it can make money. Mm -hmm. So if activities that are damaging to the environment, as an example, get taxed, and they're less profitable, 
immediately the capital will then flow toward those more sustainable options. So there we could work with regulators and policymakers, and we are doing that, to say mm -hmm. maybe you need to think about that if you really want all this money to be directed toward green outcomes. Mm -hmm. So, so many ways that we can use our influence if we band together. So we just have gotten back from COP, of course, mm -hmm. and um, there are a number of alliances that have been formed under a number of, of great leaders, Mark Carney included. Mm -hmm. So we joined something called the Net Zero Banking Alliance. Mm -hmm. And we have now something on the order of $130 trillion of capital that's committed to these various financial services alliances. Mm -hmm. That is a massive amount of power mm -hmm. if we can direct it in some sort of cohesive way. Mm -hmm. And where do you see that that should actually be directed, that sort of capital? You know, where where would it have the biggest impact? It's going to be across many different mm -hmm. facets. We need deep investment in, in green infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We need to continue to foster innovation. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you, what you find is what they call it the dead zone in terms of capital raising mm -hmm. for early stage companies. So you hit mm -hmm. your friends, friends and family around, but you're not quite big enough for the institutional community. That's a very difficult place to finance. If we can figure out ways to enable more capital to these disruptive companies that have breakthrough technologies and we can help them scale, that's a big mm -hmm. area. Again, it's our, our power and our influence on, on um, in, in creating enabling conditions on the regulatory side, and on it goes. Um, I think another area that we're definitely getting um, uh, stuck into is the area of labeling of instruments. Mm -hmm. Today, there isn't a common set of standards, frankly, not even a common universal definition of green, let alone uh, what defines a transition instrument versus mm -hmm. a green instrument versus a social instrument. Mm -hmm. I think we can provide a lot of influence there to, tr to create a little bit of a universal set of definitions mm -hmm. or at least principles. And then again, investors will have confidence. Another place is, um, and this is very complicated, but we are spending a lot of time in, in this area, is how do we put a price on natural resources and nature? Nat and then how do we create natural capital solutions that are well-funded that can be better outcomes, that can sit alongside the global push to carbon emissions reduction. We've got to think about um, complex ecosystems and biodiversity mm -hmm. in um, a lot of the financial system, mm -hmm. which we haven't yet ever done, mm -hmm. nor do we necessarily know how to do. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a lot of good intellectual capital being applied to the topic, and it's, and it's very critical. We need to have biodiversity sit alongside carbon mm -hmm. as a primary objective for us to be in a position to mitigate climate change effectively. I think what I appreciate is that you see a lot of opportunities in this. A lot of people yes. frame the whole sustainability conversation as the challenges or where we're falling short. And so, as I said, I appreciate your optimism, but there has to be something that frustrates you. I mean, mm. we're not moving quick enough or we're not doing enough. So, so what are some of those things? I think it's, it's endemic to anything that is an early stage and a high dynamic state of growth. Mm -hmm. There isn't harmony. There's not harmony across regulators. Mm -hmm. There isn't harmony across definitions. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, there's, there's no roadmap for how to do this. It's never been done before. Mm -hmm. And yet it's so urgent and critical. Mm -hmm. So you have this sort of, natural tension, which is, I want to move faster, but I don't even know how, right. and I really don't want to make uh, do it wrong. <laughs> so I think I take the view that we don't want um, the perfect to be the enemy of the good. You can't sit back and wait for everything to be perfect. Mm -hmm. So in the absence, say, of, of a standard set of definitions, you know, we then have to define what you mean when you call something green or transition as an example, if you're creating a financial instrument, you've got to define that for yourself, but you must be very transparent with what your what that is, right? Mm -hmm. Why are you labeling it this way? And why are you calling it that? Um, and, and then you are allowing your investor or your client to have, make an informed choice. Mm -hmm. They may or may not agree with your definition, but at least they know what they're getting if, if they're participating. And I think if we hold on ourselves to a very high bar, uh, in that quest, you know, to really be rigorous as the market develops, you know, we'll fill in that gap. So uh, I guess what, in answer to your question, what frustrates me is that we aren't moving fast enough to get these, to uh, recognizing how complicated it is, but to get to, uh, to some of these outcomes that would um, al allow the market to, uh, to flow more easily. There is another area of a lack of consistency of data. Mm -hmm. You know, we're hard at work. Some of our companies, we're demanding things of them as we're on our net zero journey. 
uh, we need to make sure that our clients are on the same journey. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if, for instance, we give a loan to a company that's going the other way, we're cutting against our transition journey. Mm -hmm. So, But a lot of our, our clients, particularly those actually that aren't in the high carbon emitting sectors, we're asking them, are you on a net zero journey? If they say yes, show me the data that you're on the path. A lot of them don't even have the data. Mm -hmm. And so we're asking things of them that they can't deliver on. So there's lots here. <laughs> but again, this is it's not something that we haven't seen before in the sense that these are the same kinds of things that happen in any early stage dynamic market. So mm -hmm. in, in the sense that we don't have a roadmap because we've never done it as it relates to sustainability, we have seen the movie before in some respects of, of what we need to do to help ourselves to uh, achieve these outcomes that we so desperately need. <laughs> I mean, in terms of timing, I think that's one of the, you know, we have 2030, yes. you know, as sort of this time frame that we have to achieve things by. And, and, you know, you're saying that things aren't moving fast enough. Is 2030 achievable? Are the SDGs in that time frame achievable? I believe that it's possible. Mm -hmm. I also want to be pragmatic mm -hmm. and say I think it's extremely difficult. Let's mm -hmm. just take um, CO2 emissions, for instance. Now, if even with all the pledges that we have, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of pledges with people not necessarily knowing how they're going to fulfill those pledges, mm -hmm. with all those pledges, we're, we're really likely on a trajectory of north of 2C, mm -hmm. maybe even closer to 3 than two, mm -hmm. that's pretty catastrophic for the world and that's a fail um, for 2030. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I'm saying we're on a path uh, with those numbers uh, by 2050, mm -hmm. but interim wise, um, that would mean that, that we have not been able to get there. So we really do need a doubling down of efforts, a renewed set of um, commitments and targets because 2050 is a long way away. So mm -hmm. this next decade is critical because we will, if we don't act fast, probably hit some tipping points from which there mm -hmm. is no return. So I'm equally, I would say, I'm a little bit of a, a yin and yang. When I wake up, there are some days where I'm wildly optimistic because I've been able to interact with an amazing disruptive company that's got a breakthrough technology mm -hmm. that really, really can shake up an industry that isn't yet sustainable. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, um, it's a challenge because it's so complex and the inequities that exist around the world, whether it is the stage of development of a, comp of a country, mm -hmm. you know, developing countries are saying, you know, I don't have the wherewithal necessarily to implement the things mm -hmm. that you're asking me to do. I need capital. Mm -hmm. And where is that coming from? That was a big discussion at COP, at COP, right? Exactly. Um, and there were lots of pledges to put mm -hmm. hundreds of billions toward uh, developing countries, and those haven't materialized. Mm -hmm. And we need to help them along. So those are the sorts of things that I think are um, very challenging. Mm -hmm. And then in some industries, we don't even have the breakthrough technologies yet. Mm -hmm. Aviation, great minds are working on a green Thank fuel, you. but it doesn't exist today. And yet mm -hmm. we all need to fly for our businesses and to keep the economies running. So how do you reconcile that? And probably the last one that is challenging in my mind, if we think about the ability to achieve just net zero, mm -hmm. and, I, and we're not even yet talking about social issues, so just focusing on the E, uh, about a third um, will need to come from, and this is a gross generalization, but about a third of the answer will come from disruption. Mm -hmm. About a third needs to come from process improvement or business model transition. And that's the little stuff. It's the little tweaks, fixing leaky pipes and making sure our lights aren't on at night and mm -hmm. all these sorts of things, but you know the day-to-day -day tweaks. But a third has got to come from individual choices and reduction in consumption. Mm -hmm. In some ways, to be honest, I think the individual piece of this is the hardest because mm -hmm. everybody says they want to do better. But when you ask people to give something up, mm -hmm. that's a really hard thing to ask people to do. Mm -hmm. And so that individual choice piece of this is um, a challenge. Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask, actually, where where is the onus in terms of achieving, you know, bolder progress? You know, is it in the private sector? Is it in the public sector? Everywhere. Is it with all of us? Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. All of us need to do our part, and all of us have to um, understand and appreciate the urgency. Mm -hmm. And um, we can't view it as someone else's problem. Mm -hmm. If we say it's just the private sector's issue or mm -hmm. just government's issue, that's where we failed in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so sure. if we think, you know, 10 years from now, what has the financial services industry or what has Credit Suisse themselves done to, you know, take these significant steps that are needed? 
I think the, uh, my hope would be in 10 years mm -hmm. um, that we really have accelerated that mobilization of capital mm -hmm. at scale, mm -hmm. that we really have uh, done that combination of financing the disruption that's so, so very needed in certain of these industries mm -hmm. and allowed those disruptive technologies or business models to thrive and prosper mm -hmm. and, to, and effectively to allow them to be the roadmap for the traditional industries to transition toward mm -hmm. those better outcomes. Mm -hmm. So the transition piece, of course, is very, very important there too. We can't just say it's all about the disruptors. We've got to transition mm -hmm. the traditional businesses and um, do it in a way that balances their ability to continue to operate mm -hmm. with the demands, which will be an R&D investment. It absolutely is an investment. And I think the important thing that the companies need to understand is that the return on that investment mm -hmm. is in their sustainable uh, you know, existence in the mm -hmm. future, their viability in the future. Um, but it's an upfront cost mm -hmm. and they have to grapple with that. And also the how. In mm -hmm. many cases, our companies, they're looking for the advice of mm -hmm. how do I get this done? So um, I would hope that 10 years from now, we have been able to have this permeate every industry sector that we cover mm -hmm. and, uh, and really, really get the, all those industries to, to move in that direction. Um, the other thing I guess I would hope is that we do come to these agreements on a true global carbon market, mm -hmm. a proper price on, on negative activities, mm -hmm. not just carbon, but also then back to my topic of biodiversity, how do we price in the activities that are harmful to nature? Mm -hmm. Because once again, I think if we can do that, and it is challenging, but if we can do that, and maybe it's just a handful of negative things that um, companies are doing by industry mm -hmm. that we could al allow them and ask them to say, okay, we want you to focus on CO2 emissions, mm -hmm. but one or two other things that are really, really critical, that are financially material to changing the biodiversity equation. Mm -hmm. Then I think the combination of those two things uh, could be very powerful to achieving these objectives. At Credit Suisse, um, it is a total transformation in my uh, estimation in the next 10 years mm -hmm. of our business model. Mm -hmm. It is thinking about who we service, who we bank, mm -hmm. very critically. Because if our if our companies that, that we are providing capital to mm -hmm. or financing aren't on this journey, then we will fail as an organization in mm -hmm. our own objectives. It's all, they're mutually codependent. Equally, we um, have to transform everything in our business operations. Who's our supply chain? Mm -hmm. Is our supply chain sustainable? Mm -hmm. What are we doing as employees when we make choices? Mm -hmm. uh, this idea that um, everyone needs to have a carbon budget so that you sit there and look when you're making a choice every day to either take a plane or do a Zoom call. What mm -hmm. does that actually cost from mm -hmm. a carbon point of view? So we want to arm our employees so that it becomes just so embedded in mm -hmm. everything we do and operationally, choice-wise, who we cover, how we cover them, whole business model, that's where I see us in 10 years. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you were saying is that, you know, the businesses have to see this, is, that it's not a cost. And I think our business is still seeing yeah. investments in ESG to be a cost and not a business opportunity. Yeah. And how do we change the thinking? So I, I often say sustainability is, you have to look at it with the two lenses. Mm -hmm. One's the risk lens, if you don't do it, uh, you will be disrupted out of business. And mm -hmm. we can say that in an industry at an industry level mm -hmm. because the disruptor will come and mm -hmm. those business models will be the ones of the future. Mm -hmm. And we've seen you know, many examples of that over time when you have blinders on and you keep doing it the same way you've always done it and you just don't see what's coming in from the side. Mm -hmm. I think we're at a whole new velocity of that kind of, we call it the sustainable disruptor model, mm -hmm. whole new velocity of that um, activity happening. And there are at least two or three disruptors per industry that really have the ability to shake it up. Mm -hmm. So I think on the one hand, you need to look at that and embrace that from an opportunity cost point of view. Mm -hmm. So yes, we call that a negative or a risk or a give up, mm -hmm. but at the same time, if you say it's opportunity lost, mm -hmm. um, that's a way to reframe that, right. I think. Um, on the other hand, if you then think about it that way, it opens, I always say it opens your aperture, it opens your lens to mm -hmm. seeing the opportunity. Maybe I need to be migrating my business model to adopt those sustainable practices mm -hmm. or uh, those investments. Equally, um, I think it leads you to a place where the more you are open, mm -hmm. the more you actually realize how many opportunities there are for true value creation. Mm -hmm. When I think about the individual disruptive companies that have burst onto the scene, and you name your industry, electric vehicles, 
Who would have thought? And honestly, if you had asked somebody five, seven years ago whether some little, uh, little electric vehicle startup could be worth more than the entire auto industry combined, you would have said you're crazy, mm -hmm. right? You would have said you're crazy. Um, and this, by the same vein, um, if you take the alt food space, I use this example all the time because I live in the UK. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that long ago when I moved to the UK, less than 20 years ago, that if you, I uh, chokingly say, if you said you were, you know, vegetarian or even vegan, no less, <laughs> you were kind of woo-woo, right? You were on the edge. And here we are in a day where there is every single restaurant, every single fast food chain either has a plant-based ver version or it has a vegan alternative. Think about how fast that happened in such a short period of time that the entire you know, sort of food system, restaurant system has been disrupted. Mm -hmm. And I could go on and on. In every industry, we see this transitioning happening. So I, I think that that is uh, a little bit the seed that I would want to plant, and we do plant with our clients. Mm -hmm. You know, be aware. Don't assume that this isn't for you. Assume mm -hmm. that it's coming your way, like it or not. Mm -hmm. So you can either, you know, defend and try to protect the old way of doing things, or you can seize the opportunity to be part of the solution for the future, and mm -hmm. that's the only sustainable way. Mm -hmm. I think ESG oftentimes has an image problem, you know, mm -hmm. for all of the, you know, positive stories out there, there's, you know, equal amount of greenwashing yes. stories. So I think, you know, in terms of that whole credibility issue, this is one of the reasons why I think, you know, people are still kind of skeptical yes. about, you know, these, these lofty, you know, platitudes that come yes. out. So how, how is that something that, you know, you're addressing or that you think, you know, can be addressed? Um, so I think that what you have is, Certainly in any developing market, uh, when you have a lack of standards or common taxonomy uh, or regulatory um, ma mandates, it is ripe for maybe less well-intentioned actors. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's actually not even malicious. It's a desire to do better and mm -hmm. an enthusiasm, but without substance. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is say, what does credibility and good look like? Mm -hmm. uh, in the financial services industry, that expresses itself often in a set of commonly adopted market standards. Mm -hmm. So if we take uh, the capital markets, for instance, the public mm -hmm. liquid debt markets, we have green bonds. Mm -hmm. There are a set of green bond principles which are getting, getting ever more robust in terms of what they require mm -hmm. to, uh, to be adopted. Um, we have assurance providers and uh, lots of folks in your industry uh, serve, provide that service and that function mm -hmm. to be an independent voice to take a look at uh, the commitments that are associated with that capital raising and the commitment to deploy that capital in a green way and come in and actually look at that and provide opinions on that. We have now um, developing market uh, opportunities around sustainability linked instruments mm -hmm. where there's a robust set of KPIs where a client raises capital and they are committing under a set of metrics and standards to put that capital to work. And you can check yourself against those. Mm -hmm. And that's the market's finding that very provocative because they're saying you're really putting your money where your mouth is and skin in the game. And because if you don't hit the metrics, there will be an increased cost of capital. Mm -hmm. Or if you do hit the metrics, there could be a, a reduction in your cost of capital. So it's a meaningful tie of the mm -hmm. economics to the outcomes. And I think that that's an area where we definitely... Um, see markets getting excited, mm -hmm. and that's an ability to scale. So I think this quest for that sort of common uh, set of standards, but also in a developing market, in the early days, there's genuinely less, of, less sophistication. Mm -hmm. So what gets accepted in the early phase of a dynamic growing market mm -hmm. will not be what will be acceptable several years down the line. Investors, what we're seeing, are getting much more rigorous and much more sophisticated in their ability to define what do we mean when we say it's a green investment. Mm -hmm. You know, what is what does good look like? So um, I, I see market development you know, evolving and sophistication evolving in line, which I think is really the holy grail of where we ultimately want to get to when when this is very when it's maturing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're four years into your role. You've probably seen, you've seen the role develop, you've seen the conversation develop, you've seen, you know, the momentum pick up, regulations changing and things like that. How do you feel now four years on and, you know, what are, what do you think, how do you think this is going to kind of progress? Mm -hmm. So the first two years in, it was me 
pushing, pushing, pushing the agenda mm -hmm. inside my organization and outside my organization. I felt sometimes like I was that annoying agitator <laughs> was trying to wave we the flag the, for the topic, right? <laughs> I, was, I was pushing, pushing, pushing. Sometimes, you know, meeting with a very hard wall, mm -hmm. which is, you know, why are you bothering me with this fluffy stuff? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it was um, with a bit of cynicism, but curiosity. And of course, we had some who were early adopters. But um, I would say the vast majority of my time was spent being that, um, you know, pushing the agenda. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, what happened over the last couple of years is that completely flipped over mm -hmm. to now being a pull rather than me pushing. So the demand to engage on the topic is extraordinary. And in fact, it's growing at an accelerating pace. It's almost impossible to keep up with the demand. Probably in the hour that we're having this conversation, I will go back to my desk and I'll have 300 emails of people wanting to engage on the topic. It's, it's literally kind of that level of velocity. So that is a, a wonderful place to be. Uh, it's a high class problem, <laughs> it's a, but a problem nonetheless mm -hmm. that we have to grapple with, but I'd rather be there than mm -hmm. having to push the agenda. So that just shows you how serious that's all is. Mm -hmm how it's so pervasive, how it is mm -hmm. literally everywhere. Um, so I view the, that enthusiasm as a good thing. Mm -hmm. So now the challenge is how do you harness all of that enthusiasm mm -hmm. and that desire to participate into a channeled and effective and high outcomes uh, mm -hmm. achievement way rather than a bunch of you know crazy disparate um, uh, folks with a lot of energy running around in, in some sort of disconnected, uncohesive manner. Um, but, but look, I think I would I'd say would rather be here than mm -hmm. where we were a couple of years ago. So when I project forward and say, where does that all land? I think where it ultimately lands is pretty soon in the not too distant future, we aren't going to be talking about uh, the markets in the context of what is sustainable and not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Sustainability will just truly be embedded in everything mm -hmm. we do mm -hmm. across our own operations and our businesses, but mm -hmm. also all of those of our clients. Mm -hmm. And that is ultimately, I think, the end state that we want to get to where this is just so a part of every day mm -hmm. um, delivery and how we operate that, uh, that then we're in a place where organically this is taking care of itself. Mm -hmm. And I think my, my last question for you is uh, your former CEO is going, it asked you one of the things that I would like to ask you. So what would you like your legacy to be? It's funny that I had the time to think about that before <laughs> I took the role. Um, and I can say that very succinctly that the sum total of 35 plus years in investment banking and all of that time in the markets would mean that I, I really did have the ability to mobilize capital at scale mm -hmm. to help really make a difference in some of these big world challenges. Mm -hmm. And that history of being able to speak the language of the investor mm -hmm. and also structure transactions mm -hmm. that in some cases really are breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. And one of the places that um, I guess I get the most satisfaction out of is when we look at an area and we used, usually use the lens of the UN SDGs mm -hmm. uh, to take a look at where there has not been a proper investment of private capital mm -hmm. and challenge ourselves to try to change that equation mm -hmm. through our structuring expertise, our ability to raise capital, our distribution strength, whatever. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is a hard graft. You know, If it's never been done before, you mm -hmm. roll up your sleeves and you experiment. Right. But when you have a success, it is a very, very, very sweet bit of success because you really feel like you made a difference. And that's my North Star. Mm, that's great. Um, thank you, Marisa, so much for joining us. It was wonderful to have you here and getting your insight on your role as a Chief Sustainability Officer at Credit Suisse. A pleasure to be here, and I look forward to hearing the stories of my other CSO peers in the industry and uh, to comparing notes. So congratulations on, on your work for this. I think it's actually uh, very helpful to those of us in the role to understand our peers' journey so that that can make us more effective in our own roles. And we wish you the best of luck in your role in the future. Many thanks. Thank you.